everyone. Welcome back to the DevNet Create Theater. Up next, we have uh, Heidi Waterhouse, who's going to uh, take us on a little adventure, it sounds like. So uh, Heidi, it's all yours. Hey, folks. All right, this is an interactive talk. That means all you nerds need to come closer. I'm sorry. I know it's more comfortable in the back. You might actually see some light up here, but you're going to have to do it. There we go. So this is a choose your own adventure game. I've created it in a gaming platform called Twine. And when I say choose your own adventure, I literally mean you all are going to choose what happens next in the slides. It's like slideshow karaoke, but different. It's just going to jump like that. We tried all the cables. They didn't work. We're going to work through it. So here's how I'm going to show you how it works. In the beginning, there was darkness. And then we got my friend Toggle. If I don't have any video, this is going to be problematic. OK. This is Toggle. Toggle is our non-binary space explorer. In space, there is no particular orientation. And uh, Toggle has declined to state any gender either. So let's pack everything that Toggle needs for a trip. All right, I don't like your adapter as much as mine. OK, we're going to need some rocket fuel. Rocket fuel, OK. We're going to take off. It's going to be great. Don't mix this early. Like all rocket fuel, it's a little reactive. I'm about to reboot, and that would be tedious. Uh, so we need some space lane flags. The thing that Toggle does for Space Lanes Incorporated is mark out paths that the space liners follow. And every time they do some exploring of the wormhole nexus, they find faster and better paths. But it's a little dangerous to do the exploring. So Toggle goes out and puts a space lane flag out. And if Toggle makes it safely to the end of their route, then the home office can turn on those flags, and space liners can follow the new, more efficient route. That means we don't mix a chance to be faster, and we don't send a space liner down a dead end or into something problematic. So uh, because I'm a giant nerd, space lane flags look like heliographs. <laughs> All right, uh, everybody needs a crew. Uh, Toggle usually travels alone because it's sort of dangerous in space, but they have their support crew back home. And I want to acknowledge my support crew at LaunchDarkly who helped me put this talk together. And then finally, when you get there, you're going to want some swag. So, oh, I, I left that in there. If you go to launchdarkly.com slash Heidi, we'll be happy to send you a free t-shirt. It's going to be fun. All right, so do you want to do adventure choices or the case study first? Adventure choices. Adventure choices. Oh, so many adventures. This is going to be great. Let's choose our adventure. I spent uh, an unreasonable amount of time getting the text that you cannot see to wiggle. I'm really hmm, distressing. OK. We're going to use our space imagination. Development, design, oops. Security and compliance, sales and marketing, user fun, deployment, or case study. Pick one. Design. Design. All right, so how does a space lane flag use design? Well, we could do, we found another Nexus branch where we could have some choices. What would you like to pick? A-B testing. A -B testing. So sometimes you don't know what exactly it is you want until you've done both of them and seen how people react to them. When you're doing A-B testing, you're asking a representative group of your users which they prefer. But you're not asking them by saying, fill out a survey, because nobody fills out surveys. You're just seeing which one you get more click-throughs on. But in order for this to be scientifically sound, you need to be serving equal A and B flags, even if it's only to a small percentage. And if you do that, you're going to find out that people have a preference, that people will click more often on a green button than a red button, or that people completely fail to see some other button because you've made it the color of the page. So A-B testing is one way that you can use a feature flag to shift the user experience. All right, what would you like next? 
custom documentation, white labeling, more adventure choices. Custom documentation. This is near and dear to my heart. I come from uh, 20 years of documentation experience, and I really believe that we have to give the people what they want when they want it. Because I really hate that thing where somebody says, you need documentation, you're going to have to look this up, uh, you're trying to install Windows, uh, first you need to read like the Linux stuff and the Apple stuff. Oh, here's the Windows stuff. I don't even want to know the Linux stuff and the Apple stuff exist if I'm on a Windows platform. Only give me the Windows instructions. So if we're using a flagged system, we can deliver to people only the documentation that they actually need and get out of their way with the rest of it. And I think it's a really powerful way to think about documentation. If you don't have that feature, I should never see the documentation for it unless sales wants to offer that as a feature. So like you could do upsell, like, haha, you don't get this feature, I've documented it. But most of the time, that's just annoying. What you really want is the documentation for the thing you actually have. OK, white labeling. Who here has built a website? Yeah? Who here has built a website that is almost the same for two different clients? Yeah. So it's a real problem, because if you fork them, then you have to maintain all the changes evenly all the way up. And if you don't fork them, then you have to like flip back and forth to do the customization on each one, like this one's Heinz Red, and this one is McDonald's Yellow, and you can't mix them up ever, and it's really difficult. But using feature flags, you could say, only show Heinz Red, only show McDonald's Yellow to people in these IP ranges. So you can have the same documentation, deliver all of the same content, and not have to do any kind of sophisticated branching and therefore get out of sync. All right, let's go back to adventure choices. You see this one yet? Nope. Maybe this slide is the, the one that's extra broken. There we go. There we don't go. I don't understand what's going on with this. Um, so let's see, development, oops, security and compliance, sales and marketing, user fun, Deployment and case study. You back there. Yeah, you. Development. development. Excellent. So how do feature flags help you with development? You are a developer, and your goal in life is to deploy things, but not always for external audiences. Sometimes you want to be able to deploy internally. Sometimes you want to be able to uh, take a chance on something, deploy it in production, test it without anybody seeing it. So pick one of these. Dog food. No, okay. Can you go pull up this URL on a different computer? Yes. Yeah, let's, let's try that. Yeah. Okay. So uh, what do you want to test with your dog food? You're testing it internally on your team. This is uh, the classic cartoon with the dog food bowl and the dog pooping in the dog food bowl. Um, if you didn't have that on the wall of your cube at some point, you're doing better than me. So which would you like to test, visibility or merging? Merging, OK. So for 20 years, give or take, we've been teaching people branch-based development. We're like, if you're going to do something new, the first thing you do is create a branch of the software and then go off and play in your own special area, and then when you're done with it, we're going to merge it back in. I say to people that I'm going to have a second career as a trauma therapist specializing in Git hub issues, because merge it back in is a non-trivial problem. In the time that you've been off playing in your sandbox, you should have been re-downloading to keep up to date, but you weren't, because you were focusing on something else, and your mainline project has moved on, so when you go to merge back in, everything is wrong. Everything is terrible, and you have to do cherry picking, and it's all a big mess of spaghetti. So 
it disincentivizes you from doing dog fooding because you know that it's going to be this painful experience of trying to merge back in. You're like, well, I don't really want to run that experiment because if I run that experiment, I'm going to have to do a whole bunch of code munging. So visibility is the other dog food thing. I like to talk about testing in production, especially in the era of microservices. I want you to be able to push your code out to the cloud, to your microservices, to your monolith and a bunch of different pieces, to your full range of message traffic and messiness and terror that exists out in production, because let's all be real, staging is a lie, right? Who here believes that staging is identical to production? Right, no, it's not a thing. It, it's, it's important to have a test server. It's important to try things out internally before you like go and break your, your server machines in the cloud. But let's just kill staging. Let's just test in production where nobody can see it. Test in production, give it a chance to work, and then turn it on for your customers slowly. Like do a little rollout, test it internally, do 10%, do 1%, like whatever it takes to test it in a real environment because that's gonna be a much more realistic test than what you're doing. All right, back to adventure choices. What would you like now? Um, come on, baby. Oops, security and compliance, sales and marketing, user fun, deployment, case study. Deployment. I did promise you choose your own deployment adventure, right? So what you need to remember about deployment is that, like I said, deployment is not the same as activation. When you're working in a flag, infrastructure, or flag architecture, deployment is just pushing your code out to the servers. Nobody sees it. You don't have to do it in a deployment window of Sunday at 3 a.m. because it's not going live. Activation, turning something on, is something you maybe want to do later on or in a window, but it doesn't take a long time because the code's already out there. I like to think of it as Schrodinger's code. You're pushing out all of the versions of the code possible. They exist on the server. They exist on the client. And then at the moment of truth, you're going to evaluate a flag and figure out which code you're going to serve. So here are some of the ways that we can use this. We can do a canary launch, an albatross launch, market segments, kill switch, and internal testing. What would you like? Market segments. I love market segments. If you ask my dad what kind of pie he likes, what kind of pie he wants at dinner, he will say yes. My dad is a multi-segment consumer. He is both using Android and Apple, right? Or there are people who are like, I don't eat mincemeat, that's so gross, I only ever want pumpkin. When I'm serving software, I want to be able to say, I will never offer you mincemeat. You've told me you hate mincemeat, I'm not even making mincemeat this Thanksgiving. Fine. Or I'm making mincemeat, but I'm not going to offer it to you. Being able to break your target audience up into segments by language, by accessibility need, by geographical region, by whatever your sales and marketing team is using is a super powerful way to do things. For example, when you're doing accessibility, some accessibility features conflict with other accessibility features. Like if you put in super large buttons for accessibility on a touch screen, that's not actually super helpful for people who are using a screen reader. You've just given them a whole bunch of like empty filler space and sometimes that causes long pauses in a screen reader. So if they have a way to say, I am a user with a screen reader, you would be able to put in better screen reader stuff and not the big buttons for the touch screen people. So imagine being able to segment everything that way, to be able to say, look, if I can give you the optimal customized experience of my software, I'm gonna offer it to you and it's not going to cost me much. What would you like to see next? Albatross. Albatross launch. I learned this one from Fastly and I love this. All right. You know that client you have 
who's on Java 1.6 and won't leave it. And you would just leave them behind and never do an SDK for them again, except they're also giving you millions of dollars. That client is the Albatross launch. Because what you want to do is move the main line of your software along so that you're no longer supporting antique software. And everybody gets the new SDK, and it's not voluntary for them. But you would also like antique software company to continue to give you millions of dollars. So you make a special flag for them that does legacy support. It's still expensive to do, but it's worth it because they're giving you money. And you don't have to show anybody else that you do legacy support. You can force everybody who is not paying you that much money to upgrade. And it won't even look like legacy support is an option for them anymore. So sometimes you're just dragging a company behind you, like an al albatross. All right? Oh, crap. I can't do it. Yeah. Sorry. GitHub is hard. Um, so let's talk about kill switch. No? No. There is a, a big flashy thing that says, ooga, ooga. Something has gone wrong in production. Something is spitting out garbage telemetry. You ever have that moment where you're like, what just happened? I got paged because the logs are full. Why are the logs full? Oh, because something has gone terribly, terribly wrong? Yeah, I don't like that moment either. And so what we do about it is we put a kill switch on everything. Everything that could possibly be a problem, wow, that's even worse than not even being there. Stop that. Everything that could be a problem is kill switch so that you can just roll over in bed in the middle of the night and say, I don't, I'm turning you off. You're full of errors. You're not serving properly. You're spewing out junk. Go away. Being able to do that instead of redeploy keeps you from having what we all lovingly think of as the night capital moment. Who here knows the night capital story? Oh, this is such a great story. Stop. Um, the night capital story goes like this. They had a deployment window, and they upgraded all eight of their servers. But on one of them, it didn't work right. And in the morning, when the markets opened, that one started making bad trades. And they're like, oh, this is a bad deployment. We're just going to push, re-push the deployment. It didn't get upgraded correctly. What are we going to do? We'll just push the deployment. They pushed the deployment, but it was not the good deployment. It was the bad deployment to the other seven servers, who all instantly started making bad trades at computer trading speeds. Knight Capital does not exist anymore because in the course of two hours, they lost all of their value in bad trades. That's like the ultimate DevOps horror story because it would be so easy to do. Like, who among us has not pushed a bad deploy once in a while? But you want to be able to kill things when they go wrong. So I love the idea of having a kill switch that will insulate you from that kind of problem. Because if you have one bad server out of eight, you shut it down, you figure out what's going wrong, and then you can fix it. So this is my ops thing. I really love ops people. Ops is full of people who care about things working correctly. I already talked about kill switch and deployment, um, but let's talk about what, failover or deployment failure? Failover. So you have a backup of all of your important like script as a service, like infrastructure as a service stuff, right? You, you have that backed up somewhere. Have you ever tested that backup? Because I have to tell you, I once literally lost a month of work that I had faithfully backed up to the corporate server because nobody had ever tested whether we could recover from the corporate server. And it turns out the answer was no. That was a relational database, and it couldn't be recovered. Um, I was pretty upset a little bit. Um, so when we talk about failover in feature flags, what we need to be able to do is say, not only do I have a backup, but I can switch to it on a moment's notice. 
I can spin up a new instance and flip over to it without any particular thought. I don't need to go like code any rerouting or anything. I just need to go beep and um, switch all of my traffic from one to the other. This is also super useful if you're doing like a database migration. So you could do like a blue green deployment now with feature flags, which gives you a little more nuance in how you're sending traffic over. Instead of just sending a percentage of traffic, you could like migrate one company at a time so everybody has a consistent experience. It gives you a lot of power in how you're going to do that. All right, adventure choices. Security and compliance, sales and marketing, user fun, case study. User fun, I love users. They're so unpredictable. Whatever the user's goal, we want to make sure that the users and the travelers on space lanes get the experience they're hoping for. So here are some things we can offer them. We can offer them colors, accessibility, SSO customization. What do you think? Accessibility. So I already talked some about accessibility. But, and I, I like to pick on React because it's new and shiny and it's still making some, some significant mistakes. This is, it's theoretically accessible menu, but when it reads these out, uh, the abled option does not actually come through super well. <laughs> so when you're picking your accessibility, like I said, I want you to be able to pick what kind of accessibility people need. Do they need high contrast fonts? Do they need colorblind response? Um, who here uses a monitoring system that has red and green as status values? Yeah. Have we considered that 7% of men are red, green, colorblind. That's not including the other colors of colorblindness. Just red, green, colorblind, you can't tell red and green apart reliably. That seems like kind of a bad idea, but we never think about it because we're obviously not the ones who have that problem. So if you had a way to tune accessibility for everybody, it would be a much better experience for everybody. Single sign-on and RBAC. One of the things I really care about is security. I spent a long time as a security technical writer. I worked for BitLocker. Like, I have some, some deep nerd feelings about security. And one of the things that I care about is not having to retype my password a whole bunch of times because passwords are, in fact, a terrible security key. Like, we're going to get over passwords someday, and I'm looking forward to that. But in the meantime, what if by signing into their computer or their browser, your users were also signing in to everything appropriate about your product. They're signing into their accessibility customizations, they're signing into their white labeling, they're signing into their appropriate documentation. They are, by merely like turning on their computer and logging in, customizing their whole experience of your software. We don't have to make them do that every time. We can offer them that because we already know who they are. Our customers are already signing into this site. We have all the data we need about them. If only we would use it in a way that was powerful for them and not just us. All right, back to user fun. The last one is user colors. Who here remembers the hot dog stand setting of Windows 95? Yeah? Orange, yellow, garish. Um, users have a lot of feelings about colors, and I uh, really feel this as a person who is a natural pink and sometimes obliged to use colors other than pink in my lifestyle. We have a lot of feelings about colors, and we have a lot of feelings about contrast and text, and this is one of the things I want us to offer natively is like not just one thing that does it right, but across your whole browser experience, across your whole application suite experience, everywhere you go, you never have to reset this. So that when you come across something that isn't accessible for you, it's a jolt. You don't like the product that doesn't fit you. It's like putting on the wrong pair of shoes or putting your shoes on backwards. You're like, this is wrong. 
it's only a market differentiator if we are the right pair of shoes and not the wrong pair of shoes. So be thinking about how you're going to make user customization work for you, because the future is coming, and it involves that. So adventure choices that we hope. Oh, security and compliance, sales and marketing, case study. Security and compliance. We just got our GDPR, and uh, are super excited about that. There's a lot of paperwork for that one, man. Um, so we're talking about DevSecOps and the fact that we cannot just sprinkle on security after the fact, after we've done something already. Uh, we need to bake it in. And one of the ways that we're going to bake it in is by creating flags that respect security attributes. So here are a couple things that we're doing. Which one do you want? Our back. So I talked about kill switches. Kill switches are amazing and awesome and super powerful, and you do not want everybody to have the ability to kill your uh, production servers. You want to use role-based access control to be able to set the level of what somebody can change, because otherwise it's, it's like pandemonium, people accidentally turning things off that have dependencies, like we tell them it has a dependency, but uh, I've done user testing, and I am pretty sure that 110% of people do not read warning uh, boxes anymore. So like, we do our best, but users are users. So instead, we want to make sure that only authorized users can do things in an authorized way. And part of that is making sure they can't even control things that they're not authorized for. So we also have. Auditing. You don't want to be solving an auditing mystery. Um, auditing is not just something that happens from the outside when people come in and judge you, although that part is you know, super invigorating and uh, exciting. Auditing is also what you do as part of your post-mortem to find out what went wrong. And if part of what went wrong involved feature flags, you want to be able to tell what happened. So you don't want to be like, I don't know, Events occurred, there was tequila, a flag turned off. All of those are bad excuses. Like, the passive voice is a strong indicator that somebody has screwed up. So instead, what we do is we offer a every change that happens to a flag gets audited on our side so it can't be deleted, and then you can go and look and see what happened. It seems really powerful, and I think if you're building your own feature flagging system, it's important to make sure that you're recording what happens. Because otherwise, you are going to end up in a situation where you're like, things, stuff. Also, if you're building your own feature flagging system, you want to make sure that your flag labels are not like, yo, fresh hot SSN here. Even if you are flagging on private identifiers, it's possible you should obfuscate that flag name and uh, make sure that it's not visible to anybody who intercepts your traffic, which should be encrypted. But you know, belt and suspenders is really the way to approach security. So if you're going to do that, be sure that you give people a way to make a flag attribute that doesn't reveal the flag contents. And all we have left here is sales and marketing. Maybe. Uh, currency, feature tiers, tutorials. What do you want? Tutorials. tutorials. All right. Who here has used uh, Cisco Spark? All right. You know the little pop-ups that are like, yo, did you know you could do this? Do you ever want to see those again? No. I like the thing that Slack does where they're like, I have already signed into a Slack channel. Please never tell me the welcome to Slack thing again. Shh, shh. It's super useful. So when we're doing tutorials, I want us to be able to detect somebody's state and offer them a slightly different user experience based on that. And you can do that a bunch of different ways, but I think feature flags is probably one of the most elegant ways to manage that. All right, uh, feature tiers. So LinkedIn has two settings, right? 
LinkedIn has the bugging you about LinkedIn Pro and the temporary relief of you signed up for a free month of LinkedIn Pro. Those are the only two settings, as, as far as I can tell. Um, and they are serving that with a flag. Like every time you sign in, they're like, oh, that's someone we should bother. Or you're cool. Here, here's your contacts. Um, we want our users to have different experiences depending on how much they pay. And in order to do that, we can either have, again, branched systems that we have to keep aligned, or we can have feature flags that split the system invisibly and just sort of add things in that have existed for everyone, but not everyone can see them. Does that make sense? Yeah? OK. Currency. Um, so I went to Australia in January, which was great. And then I scanned all my receipts into Expensify. And uh, Expensify doesn't know from Australia dollars. And more to the point, Australia, or Expensify doesn't realize that Puerto Rico uses, or Puerto Rico, uh, Santo Domingo uses the dollar sign for pesos, which has a really different exchange rate. So I scanned all my receipts in, and um, then I had this moment where I'm like, I don't actually feel like I should get reimbursed like $40,000. I mean, I'd take it, but uh, something has gone wrong. If only there were a way for Expensify to be aware of what country I was in when I scanned my receipts. So it said, oh, hey, does that happen to be an Australian dollar? Does that happen to be actually a peso? If only there were a way to geolocate the phone that I am using to scan receipts. There is, but we would have to be smart enough to use it. We would have to be smart enough to activate it. We'd have to say, like, hey, do you want to use geolocation to, to reconcile your receipts? But how cool would that be? Because currency is super hard. Um, I'm a, a yarn fanatic, and I buy things from Germany. And then I'm like trying to do the currency conversion in my head. And if I had a button that just said, how much in US money, I would push it, and I might buy more yarn. All right. We are now on to the case study portion of our adventure. We're going to talk about how a hypothetical space line company added feature management using flags. So what do you think they chose to start with? Are they terraforming known space, or are they uh, going to unexplored planets? Terraforming. So there's nothing new between the suns, and we all have brownfield projects. Very few of us get to start a shiny new project with nothing going on in it already. And so when I say to you, I want you to add feature flags to all your stuff, you're like, oh my god, retrofitting, no. No, I don't want to, because it's hard and miserable. So which style of retrofitting do you think we should do? Uh, slow and steady, only new features, or rip off the Band-Aid? Slow, slow and steady. Conversion is slow, but it's going to get us there eventually. There's nothing wrong with having a hybrid system with feature flags. Like, there's what you were doing before, and there's feature flags, and they can peacefully coexist. And as long as you continue adding new features with feature flags and converting some number of your features with feature flags mindfully, uh, you're going to get there eventually. It doesn't feel like very fast progress, but especially if you use analytics to determine what your most popular features are and put the majority of your efforts behind those features, you're going to be OK. It's going to work out. So we're going to assume that works great. Toggle loves everyone in this spa space cantina. Oh, it's a good picture, too. Oh, well. There we go. All right, so do you want to go down a different terraforming path, because there's always more uh, refactoring we could do, or do you want to do unexplored uh, planets? Uh, unexplored planets, I heard you, but. So unexplored planets, green field, you get to start from nothing. 
you get this beautiful, fresh sheet of paper. So how are you going to develop this? Are you going to do what you usually do, which is get in branches, or are you going to do flags in mainline? Flags in mainline. So we also call mainline development trunk-based development. Uh, you know people who are doing it, but we don't talk a lot about it in like computer science classes. We certainly don't talk about it in coding schools. But it is a valid method of development that requires a different kind of mentality in administration. So the new CTO at Space Lanes Incorporated is committed to continuous integration and deployment. They want to be able to deploy dozens of times a day and turn features on and off when they're ready. This is what they're going to do. They're going to do flags in mainline. So how does it work out for them? Planet up, planet charmed, or planet glue on? Charmed. charmed. Yeah. Oh, the feature failed fast. That was terrible. We, we never want to turn that on again. Um, it was like blink tags all over the place. Something terrible happened. So you want to try again? We turned it off. Let's, let's try again. What do you think? Move on. So in this one, you build something, you deploy it, you test it quietly. It goes fine. You start to roll out to more and more people, nothing bad happens. It's really exciting to be able to do this because you know that it's going to work when you roll it out for real. So congratulations, team. Yay. Let's go see what else we have. All right, now we've tried both terraforming and unexplored planets. What do you want to go back to? You want to rip the Band-Aid off. So it's going to hurt, but only for a little bit, because training is hard. Training people in a different way of development is hard. Every time you learn a new language or a framework or even an IDE, a new tool of some kind, there's a resistance because you know how to be fast at the thing you already know. And you're going to be slow at the thing you don't know. I don't know how many of you remember learning to touch type. But it was miserable because, uh, thanks, you could already type or you could write faster than this, and you're hunting and pecking. Uh, when I was in college, I switched from typing QWERTY to typing Dvorak, and it was like double terrible because I went from like 80 words a minute to 20 words a minute hunting and pecking on the Dvorak. I didn't have the keycaps for it, so I was like looking at a piece of paper. I type 90 words a minute now, and I have never looked back. But you have to figure out what gets people over that initial resistance. You can't just say, we're all going to be miserable and rip the Band-Aid off. You have to say, this is the promised land on the other side. Here is what we're heading for. Come with me. I will reward all of your learning. I will reward every paper you turn in that's typed. You have to give people a reason to change, because if you don't, they will resist you every step of the way. And if you ever want to make a change in a development organization, in a deployment organization, you have to show people why it's worth their while. I say this about tech writing all the time. Who here knows a developer who has gotten fired for not writing documentation? Uh, you do? That's amazing. I want to talk to you later. Who here knows a developer who has gotten a cash bonus for writing documentation? We say we want developers to write documentation, but that is a lie, because we are neither punishing nor incentivizing them. So if you want to change how people work in your development organization, you can either punish them, which makes them cranky, or you can reward them for doing the right thing. You can make it easier. You can give them rewards, and they will come along with you. So training is hard, but that's OK. So it works great. Everybody in the space canteen, I think we have, oop, nope, that was the wrong one. Case study. I think we have one more unexplored planet, and then I will leave you with my conclusion. So get in branches, 
this is how we're going to do this new greenfield development. This is how everybody knows how to do it. Everybody's comfortable with this method. What planet do you pick? One. One. Everything goes fine. A lot of people have perfectly successful companies doing Git and branches. It's not a bad method. It's just a method that we need to examine mindfully and see if it's what we actually want to be doing, if it's actually serving our purposes. So I don't want you to like go home and be like, oh my god, we've been doing development wrong. Um, I want you to think, what is it that I'm trying to do with my development and my delivery and my integration? And see if there are ways that you can optimize that. So my takeaway for this is I want you to think about new development methods that are not tool dependent. Like, you can do branches with anything. You can, SVN, you can do branches, like, right? But I want you to think about what it is that's going to make you faster and safer and more efficient. Because that's really where we need to be going. We don't need to be smarter. We need to fail less catastrophically. And the way I think about this is, I can't bench press 300 pounds, it turns out. Um, very few people can. But I could probably lift 10 pounds 30 times. So every time I make a commit smaller, a flag easier, a test more accurate, I'm lifting a smaller amount of weight, a smaller delta that will still make a difference in the long run. I'd like to thank you all for your time and attention during this presentation. If you'd like to ask me any questions, you can find me uh, down on the ground afterwards. I find it more useful than questions from the audience. And I really appreciate that you came and uh, listened to this talk. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you, Heidi. So everyone, it's lunchtime, so feel free to go grab a bite. And then back here at 1 o'clock, we're going to have John McDonough talking about how to be an Ansible contractor. Er, not uh, Ansible contributor, excuse me. <laughs>